The National Broadcasting Company wishes to call your attention to a program regularly heard on Monday evenings at 10 p.m. New York time over most of these stations. We invite you now to listen, evaluate, and perhaps become a fan of this regularly scheduled Monday night program. Here then, for your approval, is... Hi, this is Randy Stone. I cover the night beat for the Chicago Star. Stories start in many different ways. Tonight's story began when one man tried to destroy another with the strangest weapon of all, darkness. Night Beat, starring Frank Lovejoy and Stone. When your job is to walk into the darkness and discover what makes a city tick, you pick up some mighty strange friends. The winos dreaming of a muscatel paradise and cold, dark doorways. The petty larceny boys with their fast deals. The painted little dames defying the world with their brassy laughter. The homeless and the hopeless. In the city, the night is for the lost. Sometimes you feel a hunger to be with someone of the everyday world. Some nice, well-adjusted soul who's got a reason for waking up tomorrow morning. I guess that's why I dropped in to see Bessie Chatfield tonight. Bessie, a little gray-haired librarian who has charge of a small storefront library on Huron Street. No one around this time of night but Bessie and a young fellow in a gray raincoat alone at a reading table. We haven't seen you, oh, in such a long time. <laughs> well, since Forever Amber, you haven't had the kind of high-type literature that interests me. <laughs> <laughs> and when you finally do drop in, look what time you get here. Ten o'clock. Right when I have to go over and start turning off the lights. Oh, I timed it that way so I could get you behind these bookcases away from that fellow at the reading desk. <laughs> I'm afraid your timing is about 35 years off, Mr. Stone. Oh, these light switches. Why do they always put them so high up? Aren't you going to tell that fellow it's time to go home? <laughs> this is the way we tell them. We flick off the lights and then flick them on again. First, off like this. No! Don't do that! No! What? Turn the lights on quick. Let me handle this. What was the idea of doing that, mister? Is that supposed to be smart or something? Oh, now, take it easy, fella. Take or did it he easy. pay you to do it? Is that the deal? Hmm? You tell George Brewster that the game doesn't amuse me anymore. You tell him if he keeps it up, I'll kill him. I turned the lights out. It's closing time. What? Closing time? Oh. Yes, of course. What's wrong with you, buddy? Are you sick or sick? Some... Yeah, that's me. Sick. Only mine is a... It's a childhood disease. Childhood. Childhood. Now. What in the world was that? Ever seen before? He's come in a couple of times this week. Spent all his time reading some reference books at the table. Seemed to be such a nice, polite young man. Consider it kindly. Hmm, let's, let's take a look at those. Oh, my heavens. My heart is beating a mile a minute. And, and, and did you see his face? It frightened me. He was even more scared than we were. Of what? These are the books he was reading? Yes. The Mind in Limbo, Abnormal Psychology, Modern Psychiatry. Why would he want books like this? Maybe he was looking for somebody in these books. Who? Himself, Bessie. He'll be himself. (laughs) Bessie was pretty upset, so after she locked up for the night, I started walking her to the elevated station over on Lake Street. We'd walked a couple of blocks through the dark, empty streets when suddenly Bessie grabbed my arm. Mr. Stone, what? that man down the street, looking into that store window, hmm? that's him. Oh, yes, same gray raincoat, same lad. And look, Mr. Stone, what's that hand? It's a piece of pipe or something. He's breaking that store window. Yes, you wait right here, honey. Oh, be careful, Mr. Stone, be careful. Be careful. 
fellow was reaching through the broken window glass for whatever it was that had struck his fancy. He heard me coming and he turned toward me. The streetlight did something to his face. It seemed twisted and torn. He down his hand where the glass had cut him. Then I saw what he'd taken from the window. A gun. What's the idea, pal? He spun around and he started running for the elevated station down the block. And in the best tradition of the Rover boys, I stayed right on his tail. He turned back to see how I was doing and stumbled over a trash can near the curb. I caught up with him, grabbing his arm. Let go of me. Leave me alone. Uh -uh. Let go of me. He slashed the gun across my face and began running again. I stopped long enough to take a quick inventory of my teeth. Up above, I heard the elevator train coming into the station. The young fellow had reached the station steps and was going up fast, trying to make that train. I reached for one of his legs. He turned and gave it to me right in the stomach. I folded up, and I just sat there, listening to the train pull away with a fellow on it, and remembering what Bessie had said about him being such a nice, polite young man. After a while, I began to feel somewhat human again. I notified the police what had happened, and they sent a squad car out. After they left, I remembered something. A name this nice, polite young man had been throwing around. George Booster. I found a phone book in a cigar store. There were three George Boosters. The first number didn't answer. I tried the second. Hello? I'd like to speak to George Brewster. Oh, he's not in right now. Is there any message? Uh, who is this? I'm his sister. Anything wrong? Well, if this is the right George Booster, something is wrong. Is there any reason why a young fellow would want to kill your brother? Oh, that would be Morrison. Oh, I warned George. Morrison, huh? Tom Morrison. Where does he live? Uh, our old apartment, 612 Hamlin Avenue. What makes you think he wants to kill George? Well, this character broke into a store tonight and stole a gun. I sort of think he had your brother in mind when he did it. Oh, no. Well, lady, I know what I'm going to do. As fast as I hang up and can get another nickel into this phone, I'm going to call the police. Oh, I feel so bad. It's not really Morrison's fault, poor man. Oh, no, no. He's just a prince of a fellow. Goodbye, lady. I've got to make that call. But then it turned out I didn't have a nickel. And on the way to the counter for change, I started wondering why the sister of the man he was going to kill felt sorry for Morrison. And why Bessie thought he was such a sweet character. And well, the night was young. 612 Hamlin Avenue couldn't wait, and I could call the cops later. 612 North Hamlin Avenue was a second floor flat on the north side. I got there a few minutes after 11. All the windows were lit up. I rang the bell and waited. I felt a little bead of sweat zigzagging down my face like it didn't have any place to go. Yes? Oh, it's you? No, let's not close the door just yet. In fact, let's push it open all the way. My two front teeth and a few ribs. Get out of here. Now, look, pal, don't tempt me. Wait a minute. Now, look. I can't against my better judgment to listen to what you've got to say. If I leave now, the only place I'm going is the nearest police station. Police station. I guess maybe that would be the best. Hmm? Otherwise, I don't know what's going to happen. Yes, I get it. I guess you'd better call the police, mister. What do you think you're doing? Calling my bluff? The phone's right behind you. Okay, buddy. You asked for it. You're sure this is the way you want it? Yeah, it's better this way. I'm at the end of my rope. I don't want to kill him. George Brewster? Yes, George Brewster. I know how it'll end if he doesn't stop. Stop what? You call the police, mister. You'll be doing me a favor. Since when have I got to do you fits? Why aren't you calling? I'm an Eagle Scout in good standing, and I haven't done my good deed for the day. Well, you can't help me, whoever you are. Stone is the name. What makes you so sure that I can't? Thanks for even wanting to. After the bad time I gave you. Bad time? That's the understatement of a year. Well, I was panic-stricken. He's got me half crazy. What have you got to lose if you tell me about it? No. Okay. Oh, wait, wait. I don't know. I... I'm like a drowning man grasping at straws. Maybe if you talked to Brewster, told him what he's doing to me, maybe maybe then he'd leave me alone. Well, you never can tell, but I'd have to know what I'm talking about. Quite a story, mister. These lights. Look at them. Bright as the sun, aren't they? Lamps. Overhead chandeliers. Just look at them. I'd hate to see your light bills. 
people like some men need drugs. That's how I need these lights. Come again? My sanity depends on it. On these My... lights? Yes. You see, it's a sickness. They've even got a name for it. Noctophobia, it's called. It's fear of darkness. Fear of darkness? But that's for kids. It... I'm sorry. Don't be. I quite agree. Kids. Or neurotic women. But in a man of my age, it's quite ridiculous. Only when the day starts drawing to a close. When the night starts crowding in. Have you been to doctors? Sure, I've been to doctors. They tell me I shouldn't feel too badly. Plenty of people with my trouble. Hangover from childhood. An illness like... Heart trouble is an illness. I'll take the heart trouble. Maybe you haven't gone to the right kind of doctor. Maybe psychiatry could help you. Nothing is going to help me. George Brewster's going to see to that. What about this Brewster? He's trying to destroy me. <laughs> With the strangest weapon of all. The strangest weapon of all? Yes. His weapon is the night. <laughs> NBC is bringing you an encore performance of Night Beat, starring Frank Lovejoy as Randy Stone. Before continuing with our story, here is the star of another NBC program, Brian Donlevy. Thank you. It's a great pleasure to be listening here with you to Night Beat. This encore performance is NBC's way of introducing you to one of its regularly scheduled Monday night broadcasts. If you're enjoying Night Beat today, why not but to listen to the series each week in its regular time period? You'll find Night Beat just ahead of my own adventure series, Dangerous Assignment, every Monday. So, if you enjoy your mystery, give a listen to Night Beat and Dangerous Assignment tomorrow night and every Monday night on most of these NBC stations. But now, again to Randy Stone. With a weird feeling standing in Morrison's brilliantly lighted parlor listening to him tell me about his terror of darkness. A sturdy, healthy-looking man trapped by a childhood nightmare. I felt guilty listening to him like I was eavesdropping into a dark corner of his mind that was nobody's business but his own. And yet he had to tell me because he needed help. Because George Brewster was using Morrison's fear to destroy him. I was sent to Chicago by our company to replace Brewster. Until he found out why I was here, he couldn't do enough for me. He even got me this apartment. Oh, greater love hath no man. And then he found out what the setup was, and he changed fast enough. How did he find out about this fear of yours? I'm trying to tell you how. Look. The other night, the two of us were working alone in the big vault down at the office. Working on some old account. And the overhead light it blew out. Mm -hmm. Well, it was so sudden, I couldn't help myself. I tried to keep calm, but... It's like something tearing me to pieces inside. I couldn't breathe. I couldn't... Finally, I had to run. So he found out about... No, no, he wasn't sure. But it started him thinking. Yeah? The next afternoon, he came over to my desk. He was jovial, friendly, like he'd been in the beginning. Saying we'd been at each other's throats long enough. Inviting me to have dinner with him that night. Right from work, we went to his favorite spot on the north side. It was a place called the Catacombs. I began feeling uneasy the moment I entered. How do you like this place, Tom? That's okay. It's fine. It's been a favorite of mine for years. One spot in particular, the wine cellar. Uh, how do you feel about wine? I like it all right. Come on with me. I'm a wine man from way back. Oh, I say, George, I uh, wanted to talk to you about that little outburst last night. They have a different wine cellar with a different temperature for each type of wine. I haven't been sleeping very well, you me? see. Me? I prefer reasoning myself. Here we are. Huh? Uh, the white wine cellar. We'll select our own brand for our supper. Here, I'll open the door. This is a privilege only an old customer like me can get away with. Come on. It's dark down there. That's why they've got this candle here on the ledge. Got a match? I... A match, Tom? Mm. Yeah. Here. Okay. Get this candle going. Good. Now, let's go downstairs. George, you think we should do this on our own? Mm, done it hundreds of times. Been coming here for the last ten years. Now, let's go down these stairs. 
Careful. Uh, I was explaining about last night... Candle casts funny shadows, doesn't it? Notice how cool it is? Twenty feet below street level. Look, I want to talk to you about last night, George. I, uh, don't want any misunderstanding. Hmm? It's just that I've been working pretty hard Look, to Look, Tom, would it make you feel any better if you showed me you're not afraid of the dark? Okay. Blow out the candle. What are you trying to prove, Brewster? Nothing at all. It's your idea. Where are those matches I gave you? You gave me some matches? I must have lost them. It's not going to work, Brewster. I'm not insane, you know. I can stay down here until you're quite Funny, satisfied. Funny, isn't it? About this. The way it seems to close in on you. <laughs> the way you start thinking you can't breathe. I can see how someone could... What's the matter? This is ridiculous. Something so suffocating about a dark room. Stop it. Stop it. Only the heavy, smothering blackness. Stop it. Where are you going, Tom? Anything wrong? <laughs> Anything wrong? Anything wrong? Anything wrong? Anything wrong? I ran out of that cellar like a scared kid. That was a rotten thing for him to do. Like a kid playing Halloween jokes. He's fighting for his job, Stone. He's not so young anymore, he can't start all over again. So he'll do anything. Great. I'm sure he's told the people down at work. I'm sure they're all laughing at me behind my back. You don't know what that does to me. I can imagine. Today I found a new desk lamp on my desk, courtesy of George Brewster. Every day, something like that. Did you ask him why he's doing it? He won't admit he's doing anything. Says it's all my imagination that maybe I ought to see a doctor. Or better still, maybe a change of climate would help. I'd leave town in a minute. Only my future's at stake, too. And before I let him drive me crazy, I'll kill him. Well, I'm going now. I'm going to talk to this bird. Where does he live? Out in the suburbs, Lake Forest. He lives with his sister. All right, I'll give you a ring as soon as I've seen him. I hope you can do some good, Mr. Stone. Yeah. Oh, say. I almost forgot something. What? That gun you made off with. I... Maybe if we're lucky, we can talk the store owner out of pressing charges. I'll try it was a crazy thing to do. I was so desperate. Wouldn't have done you much good. When they put them in the window, they never loaded. I'll let you in on a secret. If I hadn't known that, I wouldn't have been such a hero coming here tonight. I'll let you in on a secret, Mrs. Stone. You can get bullets without a license. The gun's loaded now. <laughs> oh, great. Go and get it for me. All right. Yes, I want to give it to you. It's in my bedroom. He started for the bedroom. It's like a comedy routine where, after the big build-up, the punchline comes out right on cue. The moment he entered the other room, every light in the house suddenly went out. What happened to the lights? Take it easy. Now, where's the fuse box? I don't know. I've never had occasion to use it. Besides, if it was the fuse, all the lights wouldn't go out. It wasn't you. Use your head. How could I do it? I'm getting out of here. Hall lights out, too. Stone. Maybe something went wrong with the central wiring. But why should it happen exactly now? Wait. Huh? The downstairs apartment. Their lights are on. If it was the wire. All right, all right. Let's ask them where the fuse box is. Yes? Oh, Mr. Morrison. Uh, my lights went out. It might be a fuse. Where are the fuse boxes for these apartments, do you know? Uh, out in the back. I'll get a flashlight and show you. Hmm, here we are. The fuse box is right here below our meters. Whenever the people from the light company come out, they have a dickens of a time finding it. Will you hold the flashlight steady. Let me take a look. Wait a minute, Stone. Lower the flashlight just a little. Huh? It's not the fuse. Look at the master switch on my meter. And look at the one of Mrs. Graham's. Why, somebody pulled your switch down to off. Yes. Yes, someone surely did. Oh, here, let me push it up. There. And look upstairs. All your lights are on again. Probably some kids playing a joke. How do you suppose the rascals ever found it? It's so well hidden. Well, I, I have a theory all kids come equipped with special radar for finding things like this. Mrs. Graham, tell this gentleman who used to live in my apartment before I did. Why? Tell him. Why, you know. 
Even got the apartment for you. Your friend, Mr. Brewster. But what is Tom, that? that doesn't prove he did it. For me, it does, Stone. For me, it does. <laughs> Morrison went around to the front of his house and up the stairs to his flat. I waited in the hallway until he came down again. He looked different. His face was hard and set. His eyes were like chunks of glass punched into the flesh. What are you waiting for, Stone? Well, when we were so rudely interrupted, you were going for the gun. I've got it now. Oh, yeah. Well, hand it over and I'll bring it back. No, thanks. Well, where are you going and what are you going to do? I'm fighting for my sanity and my life. He's never going to do this to me again. Never. I can't let you do that. You're going to have to. The minute you leave here, I'm going to call every cop in the book. Yes, that's what you do, isn't it? Yeah. And I'd better give you the gun. <laughs> this could become habit for me. I dropped to my knees in the hallway, and then the hallway subdivided like something under a microscope, and there were two hallways, and then there were four. And then everywhere I looked, there were a hallway. Morrison tried to push me aside to get by me, only it was a whole circle of Morrison's. I grabbed at his legs to hold him back. It was like grabbing at a centipede. And then all the Morrison's and all the hallways brought all their guns down on my one poor head. And that was it, brothers and sisters. That was it. Feeling better, Mr. Stone? Oh, if I felt any better, I'd call the embalmer. Oh, what a business. I heard a commotion, and I came out, and you were lying here. Is this a head or a cantaloupe? Oh, how did it happen, and where's Mr. Morrison? Oh, Morrison, yeah. How long ago did you hear this commotion? Just a couple of minutes. Came out of it real fast. Yeah, an iron constitution. The phone? Yes, but don't you think you're better... Come on, lady, grab my head, put it back on nice and neat, and let's get to that phone. This is the fellow who called you before, Miss Brewster, about Morrison and your brother. Oh, yes. He's not there yet, huh? No, my brother... I don't mean your brother, I mean Morrison. What? No. Yes, yes, he sure is. Now, give me your address. The minute you hang up, get away from your house as fast as you can. Morrison's got a gun. He's half crazy. Maybe we should... Maybe we should, but I'm not going to. They'd throw the book at him ten years for attempted murder. I think I can stop him before he does anything. I'm how sorry I am about this. Lady, you and your brother should be. The cab got me out to the Lake Forest house in less than 20 minutes. The house was on a hill, and the flagstone path wound round and round for a city block until it reached the front porch. As I ran up the walk, my head started rattling like a handful of pennies in a tin cup. I felt weak and tired. All the time, I tried not to think about what I might find when I reached the house. And now I was at the end of the path, walking toward the front porch. A nerve deep in my throat started jangling like a burglar alarm. The house was in darkness. And Morrison was standing beneath a little porch light, his gun pointed right at me. You won't quit, will you, Stone? What have you done with him, Tom? He hasn't done anything with him yet, Mr. Stone. Huh? Who... I'm sitting over here at the end of the porch. I'm George's sister. Oh. I didn't see you in the dark. Why didn't you get away like I told you? you see, I won't hurt her. It's him. He'll be coming along soon. George should never have done what he did. I begged him not to. To take advantage of a man's weakness. Well, Mr. Booster is coming home. What? His car is stopping at the bottom of the hill. Now he's starting the long climb. Morrison, listen you to him. just me. sit there, the both of you. And I must insist that you be very quiet. Please listen to me. Please. Please. Keep coming up that path, Brewster. It's a long, long way. You must listen to me. Morrison, you waiting near the porch doing. light, the gun in his hand. George hurt you. We shouldn't have done Far that. below the small figure what of George Brewster, so making a long climb. You're going to kill George because he found out about your fear. But don't you see? George is afraid, too, of being 53. Brewster being had stopped at the first landing to catch his brain. breath. That's now he was climbing he up the path again. His back was Maybe a hundred steps from he his death. He was fighting for his life. Just I found myself fighting counting the steps. Closer. Why? Why are Closer. you afraid of the dark, Mr. Morrison? Don't you see? If you weren't afraid, George could not anymore. Please, listen to me. Keep your voice down. 
If you try to warn him, you both die, too. Keep coming, Brewster. What yes, is there to see? Yes, fear he kept about coming. No more than the 70 doctor steps now. Nothing in itself. All it does the is girl's hide voice the world going up on and on. And Brewster getting closer. If you believe Less in than 50 God, steps now. If you believe in your own steps. soul, how can you fear the night? What is there in the darkness that can hurt you? There's such peace in the darkness. After the heat of day is gone, the rush, the tumult, the struggle, you can breathe easy again. You can let the tightness inside unwind. He's almost close enough. Listen to me. Please listen. It's not going to work, Miss Brewster. I'm going to try and rush. Miss Brewster, stay where you are, Miss. No. You must turn the light. I tell you, stay where you are. Um, Look at her. I didn't realize. I'm not afraid. What right have you to fear? Julie, is that you on the porch? What right have you to fear, Mr. Morris? What right? Whew, what a long climb. I must be getting old. What are you doing here, Morrison? And who's this? Oh, don't mind me. I just came along for the ride. What's this all about? I... I just came to... to say goodbye, Brewster. You're leaving? Yes. I'm going back and tell them you've done a good job here. But it's not fair to replace you after so many years. You sure nobody scared you away? Well, look at him, Brewster. Does he look like he's afraid? I don't know if Julie cured Morrison of his fear of darkness. Cure is a pretty strong word. But maybe she helped. I kind of think so. I do know this. It's going to be mighty hard for Tom to fear the darkness knowing Julie is not afraid. But neither Tom nor I will ever forget what we saw as that porch light lit up her face. Julie Brewster, who did not fear the darkness, was blind. <laughs> And now that part of the story they always print in heavy type, the moral. And don't smile so indulgently. Morals are very nice things. Some of my best friends have morals. <laughs> Sir, Julie's whole life is a moral in itself. And trying to top it is like trying to follow Al Jolson with a mammy song. The best you can do is tip your hat to the fellow who wrote, Out of the night that covers me, I thank whatever gods may be for my unconquerable soul. He must have had someone like Julie in mind. Four o'clock in the morning, a stale cup of coffee, a tired sandwich, a story to dictate, and I worry about my unconquerable soul. Honey. Copy, boy. Night Beat, the new dramatic series, stars Frank Lovejoy as Randy Stone. Night Beat is written by Larry Marcus and directed by Warren Lewis. Music by Frank Worth. David Ellis played Tom. Loreen Tuttle was Ruth. Others in the cast were Charles Seal, Margaret Brayton, and Ruth Parrott. Frank Lovejoy will next be seen in Milton Sperling's production, Rock Bottom, released by Warner Brothers. NBC has presented for your approval a session of Night Beat to acquaint you with this regularly scheduled Monday evening program. If you have enjoyed this repeat broadcast, join the millions of listeners who each Monday tune for Adventure in Mystery on the regular Night Beat series. Listen then tomorrow night when again you will hear Frank Lovejoy as Randy Stone in another great action-packed story on Night Beat. For music today, hear Harvest of Stars and American Album on NBC.